Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sean Osterman. Uh, I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in, here in the Russ College of Engineering and Technology. Uh, on behalf of our new dean, Dean May Wei, who coincidentally is at the University Industry Demonstration Project in Columbus, learning how universities and industry can better collaborate on sharing technology. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here to introduce our speaker today. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to the Stocker Lecture. This is a celebration of the National Academy of Engineering's Russ Prize, and today we're going to be featuring Dr. John Simpson. I'll say a little bit more in just a moment, one of the 2019 recipients of that award. Uh, the National Academy of Engineering, the NAE, and Ohio University recognized Dr. Simpson and four others earlier this year for innovations in coronary angioplasty, enabling minimally invasive treatment of heart disease. Thank you, Zan. Um, as you may know, the Russ Prize is currently the top bioengineering prize in the world. Um, we like to think about it as being comparable to the Nobel Prize. You might not know this, but there is no Nobel Prize for engineering. So those of us who are engineers in the audience, this is, this is uh, a wonderful opportunity for us. Um, Russ College alumnus Fritz Russ, who himself was an innovator in the bioengineering bio field, and his wife, Dolores, established the Russ Prize with a gift to Ohio University. Their goal was to recognize achievement that improved the human condition, which clearly is going to be the case for the project we're having, talking about today. The Russ Prize has been awarded every year since 2001 and honored accomplishments including kidney dialysis, the automated DNA sequencer, the technology behind LASIK surgery, and cochlear implants. So we're very proud to celebrate the engineers, scientists, and physicians whom we call creators for good behind those technologies. They have literally saved and improved millions of lives, presumably many, the lives of many of the loved ones in this room. Um, so with all that poorly said, I am now happy to introduce our guest. Dr. John Simpson has helped revolutionize the field of medicine through innovations that fundamentally altered how physicians treat cardiovascular disease. An entrepreneur, in addition to being a physician, he founded Avenger Inc., a, a vascular disease technology company in 2007. He served as its CEO and then executive chair before retiring in 2017. He also started numerous other companies, including Advanced Cardiovascular Systems, Perclose, Vox Hollow Technologies, and Devices for Vascular Intervention. Dr. Simpson now focuses his efforts on the treatment of vascular disease through the development of new technologies, combined with a new approach to optical imaging. A member of the American College of Physicians and a fellow in the American College of Cardiology, he has published on a variety of medical subjects and lectured extensively throughout the world. He received master's and doctoral degrees in biomedical sciences from the University of Texas and his MD from Duke University, completing his fellowship in Interventional Cardiology at Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Simpson to Ohio University. That introduction is scary. Uh, John Simpson is not that cool. Let me just uh, let me make it uh, that part uh, really clear. Uh, what a privilege it is for me to be here, and I uh, exciting. Uh, uh, to feel like that. I know the Russ family, uh, the Russ Prize uh, Award was in, uh, in D.C., and it was absolutely a spectacular event. Uh, and I think we had maybe, i have got a little echo here. Does that bug anybody but just me? No? All right, good. I'm the only one that gets bugged. I'll just step over here and see if it makes any difference. Uh, maybe not. So, okay, the Russ Prize, uh, a lot of the, uh, the Russ family was at this uh, event, and it was just really really a lot of fun, and I'm, I feel honored and privileged uh, to uh, receive the award, uh, humbled by the fact that uh, it's a, definitely a special award, which I had, uh, had never he heard of before. I have to say that when I got the call, uh, the that I had the award, first I did not know about the award, and I didn't believe the caller. <laughs> so I said, right, I'm going to share a prize, and yeah, sure, right. Uh, uh, I don't believe that. And so I didn't accept the call. And so uh, who, uh, I've forgotten who actually did the call. This is kind of embarrassing. I can't remember the name, but it's a doctor. And then so he ended up getting my daughter-in-law's name. 
somehow, I'm not sure how he got the name, and he called her and told her about the prize, and she said, well, I'll get him. I'll call him up, and I'll tell him this, going to, this is for real. So she called me up and told me about it. I said, this is crazy. That's not for real. You're so foolish. You, you know, these young girls, I mean, what do they know? I mean, just, uh, and so anyway, it was, it was really fun. So uh, my goal today is to describe, you know, in a fun way about some of the stuff that I've done and make sure that, that uh, you understand where I come from. And uh, the talk will be generally honest. Uh, there'll be a few things that'll be a little tricky. And I'll ask you at the end if you picked up on it. So you need to look out for some weird stuff in the talk. Uh, let's see. So uh, uh, start the talk is, uh, the uh, title of the talk is From Cowboy to Country Doctor. Uh, I'm, I feel like I'm still a country doctor. I'm still a cowboy. Uh, I'd say that. So I started off, as you can see, here on a horse. Uh, and I still remember that horse. I was afraid of that horse when I got on it. Uh, afraid of the cows down here, too. This is my dad, Roland Simpson. Uh, and we're, uh, I'm being a cowboy uh, here. And this is the doctor side of me. And, and the really important part of this is the the focus needs to be on this engineering collaboration between doctors. Uh, uh, the, the, the doctors and the engineers need to collaborate. And this is a great, this one slide, I could use the whole talk uh, probably for that. But this shows, uh, so we're actually treating a patient that has a narrowed artery in the leg. The artery is actually completely blocked off here. You don't need to look at the angiogram. That is an angiogram. And here's the device that is being used to treat this artery. And this artery is being looked at now using x-ray, fluoroscopy, uh, and uh, in the traditional sense. But the, there's a, uh, so a little camera, in a way, on the end of the device. And it shows the artery from the inside. And does this look at the artery from the inside? It is the thing that I think is, the, is kind of the most exciting, the most appealing thing. Because we can now do things to the arteries safely that we could not do before. So uh, the reason that this is important is that when you look at this slide, and this is our basic assumption that we always uh, need to work to improve the approximation to the truth. So my professor told me when I started graduate school, he said, this is your job every day. You need to work on this. You'll never get there. I said, OK. And he said, you have to be able to accept the fact that you will never get to the truth. But if you're not trying to improve the approximation of the truth on a daily basis, then you will not be doing your job. And if you, if you keep doing that, you will be better equipped to deal with some major setbacks along the way. And there are going to be major, major setbacks. So you need to stay, but need to stay focused on the truth. So this is the truth about blood vessels. So this is a normal blood vessel with a so-called H&E stain, a histology stain. And it shows the artery has uh, three layers that are important. They're named. Uh, actually, there may be the fourth layer in here is the intima, that little black line and it's called the internal elastic lamina. This is called media, and this is called external elastic lamina, this particular black line here with this uh, stain. This, uh, it turns out this is a trichrome stain, not, a, a, uh, not an H&E uh, &E stain. And then this is the adventitia out here on the outside. So this is a normal artery that hasn't been messed with, and this is an artery that has been messed with, set of balloon angioplasty, and these are normal pig arteries. And if you mess with the artery, in a negative way, and if you disrupt this outer boundary here, uh, then you get a big scar formed. And if you tear the media here away from the adventitia, you get a big scar formed over here. So this big scar is the problem. So it is the truth that if you mess with an artery and things do not go well, uh, and the artery becomes disrupted, and these uh, central boundaries of the artery are disrupted, then there'll be a price to be paid for the, from the patient's perspective. This uh, artery is likely to re-narrow. So this is our, we're all, we're all on the same page now uh, as to about how, this, how vascular disease works. So any time you do angioplasty or stent or put a balloon or anything inside an artery, this is inevitable. Inevitably, you're going to have to do something to the lining of the artery. So you have to be cautious about that. So, for example, if you put a stent in an artery, you need to put a drug on the stent to suppress this uh, because the stents, the arteries don't like stents, uh, really. Julio Palmas gave this talk, I think, a couple weeks ago, and he's my best friend, and he's really big on stents. I'm not so big on stents, but uh, they, we don't tell Julio that. Uh, uh, no. 
So this is the vocabulary that is unique uh, to this talk. So angioplasty is placing a balloon to expand a narrowed artery, atherectomy, plaque removal from human arteries, OCT is optical coherence tomography, it's a method for tissue imaging, pantheris is an OCT guided atherectomy catheter, EEL, external elastic lamina, stains black on the EVG stain on the microscope, SMC, smooth muscle cells and vessel walls uh, that are damaged and repaired. Avenger is a small town in East Texas, and the B-24 is a World War II heavy bomber. So this all fits together. <laughs> We're all on the same page. You're thinking, this guy's crazy. This has no relevance to anything that we're talking about. OK, so how does the World War II heavy bomber come into play here? Well, because it was a, uh, a student, an engineering student uh, from uh, the University of Missouri. His name was Lawrence uh, Patrick Calkin, first Lieutenant Lawrence Patrick Calkin. And he was an engineering student at the University of Missouri in the time when World War II uh, started. So it turns out that he was my grandmother's lawn boy. He did a good job, won the lawn, according to my grandmother. She exaggerated all the stories about him, I think. Uh, then he was, at, at 22 years old, he provided bombing support for the Normandy invasion uh, and out of Halesworth, England. Uh, and then on September the 27th, which will be in a few days uh, at the 75 year anniversary, then he bombed Hitler's tank factories in Kassel, Germany. So although I never met Lieutenant Kalkin, I did go to Kassel last year. So here's a picture of me in Kassel, uh, Germany. Uh, we were taking a, a catheters, the uh, catheters to clean out the arteries, working with Dr. Artie Swint. We treated two patients from the Kassel uh, area and these are the arteries that are being cleaned out here. It's not so, uh, it's a little bit hard to see at this distance, but uh, arteries were narrowed and using the uh, pantheris device, we cleaned them out and that's all the tissue that we got out of on the bottom and my pointer seems to, oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, maybe a, another battery for the pointer, is that possible or? Oh, uh, here we go, uh, maybe it's this, me not using it correctly. So that's the tissue that we took out of these arteries. Arteries are narrowed up here, and this is in Kassel, Germany. So uh, as we talk about engineers, and this is going to be important uh, to understand, and I value these, uh, our, my engineering colleagues uh, dramatically, so here's one of them. I don't have his permission to do this. I just took this picture of him a couple of days ago without him knowing about it. So he doesn't know that he's being shown here. But as an engineer, uh, he was born in Saigon in 1973. His dad spent eight years as a prisoner of war because he was a U.S. interpreter uh, after the Vietnam War. He escaped Vietnam as a boat person when he was 14, and most of you are too young to even maybe even remember almost the Vietnam War, but uh, a large number of the young people that tried to escape had to escape on boats. He was in, uh, in, in Indonesia for five years, then in a refugee camp, sent back to South Vietnam homeless, Married, had his first child, uh, who died at birth, uh, and the doctor did not explain why. Uh, he applied for asylum in the U.S., finally got it, worked as a jewelry maker uh, and a watch repairman, got a job through a cousin at a U.S.-based medical device company, eventually worked for me at a company called Amager, and he assembled the devices that I used in that patient in Castle. So here's a guy who is like self-educated, self-motivated, just obsessed, and you can see here, he's working really hard. Uh, he's obsessed with doing something that is really good and is making a contribution to patient care and patient outcomes. You can be obsessed about a lot of things in medicine and engineering, uh, but I like the obsession about patient uh, outcomes. Some people are obsessed about making a lot of money. Uh, everybody wants to make some money, but along the way, uh, that should be along the way. The patient outcomes will be the thing that would drive Drive the success of all of this. Well, how do you get from, how do I get to have the privilege of meeting people uh, like this and working with engineers or, or, or individuals with this kind of a history? And uh, so is it kind of a straight line? It's not a straight line, but here's my academic history and some jobs that I had along the way. So I went to high school in Lubbock, Texas, went to Texas Tech. I did not flunk out, okay? Let's just set that aside right now. I transferred before I received the letter of academic ineligibility. <laughs> Timing is everything. And I, for sure, 
and time me. So I transferred to Ohio State. You've heard of Ohio State. I don't know if you know that. It's this, it's, you know about that school. Uh, so I transferred there. I, I transferred there as a pre-vet major. Uh, I met Lynn. Uh, I married Lynn, smartest, smartest move of my life. My first job after graduation was a bank teller uh, in Columbus at the Ohio National Bank in Upper Arlington. Uh, I was a teller in training, and then uh, while I was there, then Jack Nicholas's assistant deposited his 1967 $30,000 U.S. Opens winning check in my teller cage. So I was the fourth teller cage, which was way down at the end, and his secretary is about 90 years old. I think she thought I was kind of cute. So she uh, deposited the check in my case, and I was so excited about this check, $30,000, I had never seen that kind of money before. I thought, this is like, I'm, I can't imagine it. So the, uh, I carried that check all around the bank. I misplaced it. Uh, when I got back to the uh, my teller case, it was out of balance by $30,000 that night, and they didn't find it for 10 days. It went to Fort, uh, it was supposed to go to Cleveland. I put it in the wrong stack, and it went to Fort Worth. Uh, for the clearing, uh, what did they do with that? And no, no computers in that era. So uh, the, the bank guy, the manager of the bank, uh, told me that I was not cut out to be a banker. Uh, and I think that was probably absolute confirmation uh, that I was not cut out to be a banker, and I got fired. Uh, so my, uh, my wife is pregnant with our first child, so then it was a, it was a troubling time, uh, uh, if you will. So a recent graduate, uh, no job, no school, and a baby on the way. Uh, so it, uh, it kind of puts things in perspective. I think I had a discussion earlier with one of the students and said, so what were some troubling times that you may have encountered along the way? And this was one of them. Uh, so uh, but I decided to go to graduate school. I, I got in at the University of Texas, you know, eventually into med school at Duke, uh, internship and residence, and then cardiology training at Stanford. So uh, here's the starting point uh, for my career. I've got some problems with my pants here. I don't know what that is, but it's my dog. Uh, Lubbock, Texas, 1954, and it worked working kind of through Avenger. And Avenger is this town in East Texas where I learned to ride horses and hunt and fish and do all this fun stuff. Um, and I named a company uh, after that was mentioned in the introduction, after Avenger, because I have such strong attachments uh, to the town. Uh, but it's a town of 444 people. And uh, just uh, was special uh, in my life, I would say. The uh, Avenger uh, was a, an important phase. Uh, that's where I got started. But this is like the most pivotal experience maybe in my professional career. So I met this guy, Andreas Grinzi. And Andreas came to Stanford uh, to give a talk. Uh, and he said that uh, the title of the talk was Balloon Angioplasty and Human Coronary Arteries. And I read the talk, and I was a fellow at Stanford at the time. And uh, it was the noon conference, and the noon conference was actually in this room, 112. Uh, so that's what these are really authentic uh, uh, pictures. I took the picture of room 112. Nobody's very, it's not a great picture, but it is the real picture. So the reason that I went to the talk is because the son says, uh, you know, Andreas Grunzig talk, balloon angioplasty, coronary arteries, and you get a free sandwich. Yes, I am in. Noon conference, free sandwich. How do you not go uh, to hear that? I guess everybody here doesn't need a free sandwich, so I guess that uh, doesn't apply. So here's the guy that's talking. He's going to put a balloon into somebody's coronary artery. He's going to blow the balloon up and they're going to get better. And I'm thinking, yeah, get better or they're going to get worse. And this could be a kind of a toss-up, is the way I looked at it at the time. So my wife picked me up and asked me about this talk that I'd heard. And I said, yeah, this guy is either going to revolutionize the treatment of vascular disease or he's going to go to jail. Uh, and I really thought jail for Andreas was going to be the, uh, the more likely outcome. So uh, I came back from, uh, I went to visit Andreas, and I came back from my uh, trip there. This shows, again, trying to be authentic, the confirmation that I went to see him. This is the flight that I was on. I went to London first, then to, uh, uh, on to uh, Frankfurt. And here you can see, uh, it looks like if the lights were turned down just a hair, it looks like we've all been to the tanning salon. Um, and, 
uh, it'll be better than all the wine that we have consumed. And we have consumed a fair amount of wine. So I'm looking a little bit younger there and a little bit different hair color. I'm sorry, this pointer. Uh, maybe I'm making it. Okay, there's uh, this Andreas uh, over here. So here's Richard Myler, who was one of the founders, first did the first angioplasty in humans in the U.S. Uh, but anyway, that night we formed the International Dilatation Society, and here's the uh, cork that we've all signed. So, uh, January the 11th of 78, Andreas Grunzig, the chairman of the board, JBS, that's me, KC, you understand what KC means? Keeper of the cork. <laughs> that's the lowest role. He's chairman of the board, uh, and I'm, I'm keeper of the cork. It's the bottom of the cork that you can see there. So I came back from that trip and I decided I wanted to, to do balloon angioplasty because he had described how this was all done. And uh, I said, okay, um, I need to order the equipment from Andreas, having no interest at all in developing a catheter, zero. I never even heard of that. Andreas sent me a lot of stuff, but I did not get the balloon. So I said, okay, well, he made his in his kitchen, I'll make mine in some in my kitchen. And if he can do it, I can do it. Uh, there's a little bit of a stretch, however. This is the first balloon catheter that we ever made. Uh, and this was uh, not, uh, it's, like I say, this is like all new boys, it's not that pretty. But it was a beginning, it was a start. And so this is on 311, 1978. Now that catheter uh, grew up to be a better catheter. This is uh, uh, what they eventually look like, and they're streamlined, and they have guide wires that go through them. And my contribution was that this guide wire could be moved and directed. And you can't see it here, but this movable guide wire allowed us to position guide, we're allowed to position guide wires now inside the artery so we could advance catheters over the wires in a way that the existing catheters that Andreas had made did not permit. And so it was this movable guide wire. I know it seems like, okay, really a movable guide wire? Is that a big deal? It was a big deal because it made the procedure simpler and, and it had better outcomes. So, Simple and better outcomes is usually something that's particularly valuable in the, in the coronary space. Also, the coronaries are fragile, so you need to be careful. I've done a lot of work in the legs also, but uh, you can get by with a lot of stuff in the legs and I'll show some of that that you can't get by with um, in, in coronary arteries. So you kind of keep that in perspective. But this uh, became an uh, company, so this eventually Advanced Cardiovascular System sold to uh, Eli Lilly, and they made it a part of Guidon Corporation. Then they sold it to Abbott Laboratories. Uh, no, Boston Scientific, and then Boston Scientific sold it to Abbott Laboratories. So it's like these crazy things. You always, if you get involved in the entrepreneurial side of this space, which is not maybe the part that is the most interesting, you see your devices bounce around from company to company to company, uh, and you never know exactly where they're gonna end up. So, um, but the device, if you have really, really, really good technology and unique technology, it sometimes will attract unique patients. So this particular uh, patient is a, in 1984, is a race car driver, complained of angina when they got this, uh, whatever this Nissan race car is, up to 180 miles an hour, he developed chest pain. I would too. So I didn't think that, that was so deal, but he was seen at Yale University, misdiagnosed as having coronary spasm. Um, went to UCLA, they said he could have a bypass operation, but it'd be even too dangerous even to study him. Uh, then he went to Hogue Memorial Hospital and, uh, and then was transferred to Sequoia Hospital in Menlo Park, only because, and transferred us, only because of the technology that we had available to us because we had this movable guide wire balloon angioplasty system. So here's his narrowing uh, in his coronary artery. And this shows JS uh, here, 58-year-old male. And so the narrowing is right here. So this is an angiogram for those of you that are not used to looking at these things. So the, we inject x-ray dye into the artery, and the uh, x-ray dye fills the artery unless this has a blockage. So this is a blockage inside the artery. And we put a balloon in this, and we inflate the balloon twice to 60 PSI in that era. And uh, here's the result of it. This is a spectacular result, and this never recurred. A lot of these do recur in that era. It was pretty common to have a recurrence, but uh, uh, his never did. Uh, and so I got a call from uh, 
Joel Manchester, who told me he's referring this patient. I said, who is the patient? It's before I actually had seen the patient. He said he didn't want to use his name over the phone because he's sort of VIP. And I said, okay, great. Um, and so my wife said the next morning, so who was the, what was the call last night from Joel Manchester? And I said, well, he's referring to the patient. And I said, as soon as then, I said, it's Mr. Woodward. And she said, who's Mr. Woodward? I said, no, he's married to Joanne Woodward. Uh-huh, somebody old enough to know the Joanne Woodward. So this is uh, a race car driver. Uh, so uh, uh, Mr. Woodward here. She said, you're a dumb shit. That's the way she characterized my. Uh, so does he recognize Mr. Woodward here? Uh, super good guy. Uh, and he, he attributed the fact that he never had a recurrence with this problem to the the uh, salad dressing uh, uh, that he made to say it's, it's really good for you. So I can show this, and it's not a violation of uh, any HIPAA requirements now. Uh, unfortunately, he died of, of, of uh, lung cancer. Uh, he told me he never smoked. I have it from other authorities that that's a crock uh, <laughs> that he did. But uh, uh, an interesting guy because the first thing he told me when he came to the hospital is the doctor treat me just like a regular. I don't want any no shortcuts. Just do what you would what you would normally do. So that worked out uh, really quite well. I think the nursing staff are disappointed that it never recurred. We've had a lot of patients that had a lot of recurrences. They kept coming back. They were hoping for that uh, for the race car driver, but that really never occurred. So here's the problem uh, that we've already characterized a little bit, talking about damaged arteries. But this artery you can see now is, uh, has been torn up, and this is in this pig model. But behind the, uh, uh, this flap is here, you get the scar forms. So see all these little splotchy things in this area? These are all capillaries that are being formed. You don't see them over here. There's enough oxygen that gets to this part. Uh, I think it, uh, you don't have the same kind of angiogenic driver. Uh, if you will, but angiogenesis is this formation of the new capillaries, and there's a uh, limited supply of oxygen that gets through the diffusion through this medium. And so these are the kinds of things that, uh, that we need to know more about. We need to know more about a better understanding of the biology of all of this, and it still continues. Like right now, we have drugs that would suppress these kind of healing responses, but uh, overall, we still are, so you, Although somebody out here should be still thinking about how, how to help us fix this problem. And the reason that it's a problem, I can, and this confirms it. So here's a narrowed artery here, treated with this catheter right here. And that's the uh, catheter in there treating the artery. And it looks really pretty good. Uh, hard to see it there. Here's a balloon to just kind of touch it up a little bit. And then this is what it looks like. And you can't see that on the screen here, but this has a flap down here in it. Uh, you can see angiographically, and that flap caused the artery to re-narrow. So, narrow to begin with, and then re-narrows. But the part that we cleaned out, and this might be a little bit in the weeds here, right in this audience, but the part that was cleaned out looks fine, and the part that was blown and dissected scarred down again. And it's this, so I'm absolute confirmation that if you, if you balloon and dissect an artery, just next to a place that you've cleaned out, then the dissection is going to form a scar. It is inevitable. Uh, but maybe you just clean these arteries out, and maybe you don't have to put a stent in. And maybe you don't, that's what I argue with Julio Palmas about all the time. That if I could clean these arteries out uh, safely, then uh, I wouldn't need your stent. He says that's not true, but I don't know. Uh, so how would we clean an artery out? So this is a device that we would use to clean out a leg artery. And it has a shaving element up here on the top. Uh, we don't have to go into too much detail on that. But here's the way that that actually works. So here's an artery that uh, the patient was scheduled for an amputation uh, by a friend of mine who was a surgeon. And he said that there was nothing to offer this patient. And we used that device to clean out this artery. And that's what it looked, no artery. Yes, an artery. And this all the stuff we cleaned out. Then it recurred. And then we cleaned it out again. And it never recurred. So he survived 11 years, still had his leg when he died at 86 of heart failure. And the surgeons, my friend, uh, still was, was angry with me because I fixed it. Uh, 
which I thought was not a good reason to be angry with a friend, um, and didn't speak to me for almost a year. It's like totally weird. I don't want to say classic surgeon, but classic surgeon uh, <laughs> at that point. Um, so, uh, and it's just that anybody, I, I do say that, you know, vascular disease is really, really a little bit unpredictable. So if we want to look at these arteries, how we, could we look at them while we're treating them? Well, here's the artery that we're talking about, and these are all the elements that we could see in the artery, the media, and the adventitia, and they're all labeled here. You could look at that using this system called optical coherence tomography, and it will show you the same thing. You get to see the labels, the, the layers of the vessels, and you get to see the definition of the artery in the way that, almost like you're looking through a microscope. And so if plaque is deposited inside this vessel, here, you can actually see where it goes, if it goes out, and, and this is actually a normal artery. So this is what it looks like under the microscope, and this is what it looks like under OCT, and it, I mean, it looks uh, almost identical. To get this image, you have to flush the blood out of the way. OCT doesn't see through, see through blood very well, but it just requires a catheter to do that, and I'm pretty good at making catheters uh, to do that. I'm not very good at all at imaging. I have no idea how this works, by the way called optical coherence tomography. I have zero. There's a laser, and it sends it out, and stuff happens, and then it processes it, and then I get this image. So that's all I care about. Now the engineers, I love the engineers that are doing it, and they're great, and I want to keep working with them because I'm totally dependent on the engineers. I'm, more, I'm more, actually much more dependent on the engineers than they are on me. I say, look, here's the deal. We need we need to image these arteries, and they need to look like so-and-so, and now you do it. And I, my job's done, right? Now <laughs> they have to do all the heavy lifting. And, and that's the exciting part about having have a good collaboration. Uh, of course, after they do it, then they give it back to me, and they say, okay, now you test it. And I go, ooh, so now then, is it going to work the way you, I, it's going to work. It's going to be fun. So that being said, here's a, a, uh, an animation that shows how the, the, that system works, if you will. And so here's a, a plaque uh, up here at the top of this artery, draw it here, the yellow stuff. So this particular catheter has the uh, optical fiber that comes down through the center of the catheter, and then the light from the, uh, and generates the laser signals at the back, it generates the uh, light comes out. It goes out into the tissue, comes back into the catheter, gets absorbed, goes back up the laser fiber, goes in the computer, gets processed, and then you get the image, right? So <clears throat> we'll play this. Uh, so far, this uh, device uh, has worked 100% of the time in the animation. Oh, it's a test to see if you're listening. You see, it wasn't, uh, yeah, you weren't listening too clearly. Okay. All right, so here's the uh, animation. So here's the light coming out of the cutter. And we're going to watch the cutter, watch it on this uh, system here in the bottom right. And it tells you if we're doing the right thing, we're going to do that. We're going to go back and repeat it uh, as we need to to take out uh, more material. And it's called atherectomy. That's one of the terms of the vocabulary uh, list that we we're talking about. Uh, and so this is plaque. And then this, the cells that are down in the artery wall that are form the scar are also called smooth muscle cells. So this is the, uh, uh, the way that that device works. And this, uh, slide is a little bit out of order. So here's the, the flap here that we want to cut out. And here is the device actually cutting the flap out and you'll see so this is the OCT image, and there's probably maybe a little more, uh, maybe like say in the, in the weeds than you need, but we're looking around to see inside this artery in this patient. We're looking to see if we can see the flap, and we can, here's the flap right, uh, we went by it, we're gonna come back here to, so we're aiming our device around at the flap based on uh, this OCT image. Now we're turning the device, uh, normal artery, normal artery, that's normal media, normal adventitia out here. Uh, and here's the flap that we want to cut out. So you can only see this by OCT. The x-ray images will not confirm that you, where this device is actually 
when you aim this, this, this is the cutter that is aimed at it. And so now we'll cut the flap out. And here's the flap up here at the top. So here's the before we did it. Here's the flap right here. And here's what it looks like after. And up at the top there, that's the flap that we uh, were able to take out. And this is what the uh, histology looks like. It has a, a lot of lipid in it, which is not so relevant. But to show, it's the only way to really do this effectively is to do it with OCT that's in a fairly large artery. But now how about an artery that's the same size as a coronary artery? So this would be a coronary artery side vessel here. It's below the knee. Uh, it's called a popliteal artery. Uh, and this is a tight and narrow way. It's filled up with all kinds of junk. Uh, and you'd feel like if you're going to put a cutter down to cut the material out, you can aim it anywhere. It'd be fine, because there's so much stuff down there. Of course, I wouldn't have mentioned it that way if that turned out to be the case. Uh, so here's the device done in this little branch going off to the side here. Here's the device over here. And here's the result after we clean it. So here's it's tightly narrowed. It's not narrowed at all down here. So th this is better than this. We all agree on that? I just want to make sure you know that this is good. And th this is bad, and th this is good. Down here at the bottom. All right, so we took the, put the device down there. It turns out we opened the cutter, and the cutter is sitting over here on this top left side, and that's all normal artery up there. So we have to turn the cutter around. Those are normal layers that you've learned to know about by OCT. Uh, we turn the cutter around, uh, then we go, use the cutter to cut back down to normal layers again. Here they come, and then we stop. And we stop and we part off, and that's what it looks like we parts off. So <clears throat> the point being, I know it's, it's a little bit more uh, esoteric maybe than uh, uh, you would like. However, the, what it says is that in small vessels like this, particularly in the coronary artery-sized uh, arteries, and particularly those that are kind of small and fragile, that you want to be able to stop cutting or if you're going to clean it out. If you want to avoid stenting, you want to clean it out, you have to have something that would allow you to do that in a rational way. So that's going to replay for some reason, which I'm not sure why, but now then. Um, well, at the risk of really kind of boring you a little bit more, this is kind of the newest version. So in order to get inside the coronary arteries, you have to be really, really small. And so this shows that this is a guide wire over here on a finger. Here's the finger down here by OCT. And this is the new imaging guide wire that we actually image on the guide wire. So our OCT image, or one lady said, it's like a GoPro camera on a small stick. It is. It's a really small GoPro camera. It's a really small stick. So it's a 014 guide wire, 14,000 guide wire, and that's what's used in commonly in the coronary arteries currently. And with that, uh, we start this. And this is just, here's the video image of the, here's, here's a finger. Here's the guide wire outside. Here's that spinning element, the little GoPro, 14,000 wire. And so this is turning around. And we can see where it is based on those CT image when it'd be hard to do this fluoroscopically, if you will. So that's uh, kind of the, 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 uh, the evolution, let's say, of the device side of the presentation. So what happened to Lieutenant Culkin? Uh, so unfortunately for Lieutenant Culkin, then he uh, was killed uh, after bombing Castle. Uh, so on his way back from Castle to Hellsworth, uh, there was a mid-air collision <coughs> between Lieutenant Culkin's plane and a Lieutenant Falk's uh, plane. And the government investigated, and they said that 65% of the fault of the crash of the mid-air collision was Falk's, but 35% was Lieutenant Culkin because he was too close uh, to Falk's, and Falk's plane flipped over, having been damaged in the bombing raid on Castle, and they killed everybody on both on both planes. Uh, so uh, showing this also just to show a, another collaborator that we have. So Greg Robertson, Dr. Greg Robertson, he may have some relatives here. Is there anybody here that's related to Greg Robertson? Oh, bummer. They're supposed to be. You sure you're embarrassed to say? <laughs> OK, I was going to show that because of Greg, because this also shows this device uh, down here. Uh, it's like, it looks like it's out in no man's land, because here's the angiogram that shows it looks like it's perforated the artery. 
this is in the wrong place, but it turns out by OCT, it's in the right place. Well, that's probably uh, irrelevant. So uh, I transferred to Texas Tech and Ohio State because I knew that they had a vet school and, and Sports Illustrated they had a good basketball team, and I couldn't play basketball. I thought that uh, I was terrible. Uh, but through perseverance, uh, uh, my son uh, uh, was better at, at basketball than I was. Uh, so he had the advantage of being really pretty young and pretty strong uh, that he uh, uh, could pick up his sister uh, when she had a cerebral hemorrhage uh, not too long after the photograph was taken, and, uh, and this is around Thanksgiving. Uh, picked up his sister, and she had a cerebral hemorrhage from a, a venous malformation, and she's like in her, in her early 40s. Uh, and she, uh, thanks to amazing surgery, amazing technology, and thanks to a laser, uh, then I'm kind of laser fanatic now then, this is her now. So she's fully recovered. Uh, she couldn't speak or uh, smile uh, at this point. She can speak now, uh, normally, uh, perfectly. Uh, and uh, so her story is, I think, you know, still in incredible. Uh, Gary Steinberg at Stanford did her surgery. I've always said about Stanford, I trained there. I said, you never, ever want to have to go to Stanford. But if you have to go, it's a great hospital uh, for that. And she had to go uh, to Stanford because they were the only place doing this ablation of these venous malformation type things. And um, so that was, uh, uh, was quite remarkable. So what are the chances? Let me see, OK. Oh, the rest, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, um, I have this slide a little bit. I see anyway. What are the chances that uh, she is Lieutenant Culkin's granddaughter? No chance, right? Lieutenant Culkin? So suppose that Lieutenant Culkin is my father. Could that work? So I said, my name is Simpson. And I showed you a picture of Roland Simpson. Um, so suppose that Lieutenant Culkin is killed in the plane crash in World War II, and my mother remarries um, Roland Simpson. And then my kids have two grandfathers. Roland Simpson's one. He's as remarkable as Lieutenant Culkin. But genetically, uh, Lieutenant Culkin would be the grandfather to my daughter Kendall and to JD, and they both persevere beyond belief. JD, to be able to play basketball at Duke and not being the most talented player, oh, well, I thought he was the most talented, Coach K didn't agree. Uh, but, uh, and also for her to overcome the effects of this stroke and to be able to uh, do all this, I think is partly related to the perseverance uh, that came from uh, Lieutenant Culkin, sort of the bravery that he had. Um, and I, we thank uh, Lieutenant Culkin. I gave this talk actually on D-Day, uh, and uh, he, pr he provided bombing support for the Normandy invasion. So I gave this talk at, at the University of Washington, or a similar talk. And this was literally 75 years to the day before when he was bombing uh, in defense of, of Normandy. So thanks uh, uh, to him uh, for making all this possible, but also thanks to the Russ family. Uh, for making uh, this possible, and it's really a, a, a marvelous uh, opportunity for me to be here, and I want to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. This is a comment, not a question. Your race car driver attended Ohio University many years ago. Did he? He did. He did not graduate, <laughs> no. but he that, attended. That does not surprise me, uh, actually, having uh, long uh, discussions uh, with him. But he's a good race car driver, too, actually. I did not know he went to, uh... oh, that's cool.
Thank you. Uh, I have a very uh, naive question. Uh, you had a slide on the patient you showed that's going to lose their leg and then uh, they lived 11 years and still had their leg. Um, you showed two slides when you, well, two pictures of when you clean up the leg. And it, it ha I think the first cleanup was in March and then it happened again in July of the same year. Um, why would that happen if that's already cleaned up? Yeah, you would think that surely. So atherosclerosis itself takes years to develop. So it tells you already that if it comes back in three months, it's all scar tissue from inflammation and then smooth muscle cell proliferation and migration. And those are the two components that, and you know these scars that I showed in the pig uh, coronaries, those scars form really quickly. So if you cut too deeply into the artery wall and you damage the media, damage the adventitia, which we did, we didn't have any imaging at the time. You damage all of that, then it's more likely to form a scar. And they can, they can, the scar can form in a, in a period of weeks. Okay, so the second one is the scar. Second one, the recurrence is always a scar when it occurs quickly. If it recurs over three or four years, then it could be the same kind of cholesterol deposit that originally caused the, the problem to begin with. But that was in three months, you're exactly right, that's a scar. Okay. And that's why you would suppress with a drug if you put a stent in there. Yeah, thank you very much. That was <clears throat> fascinating. When, especially for me, when you're when you're carving out the plaque, um, do you, I assume you stop the blood flow in that area when you do that? Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you, for a little bit. I mean, not for very long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but how do you do that? Do, do, do you have minor clips on on each side of the? Uh, no. So it, it's interesting. So we have a balloon on the back side of the catheter that supports the device, and we push it up against the wall of the vessel. And the balloon does two things. It obstructs flow a little bit, and it keeps you approximated to the part that you want to treat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't show that very well that, in that. that. That's fine. And, and do you have to worry about the heat generated as this uh, machine is uh, rapidly cutting? Um, is that a problem? So it's fascinating that, that you would make note of that. I think it is a problem, actually. This machine spins at 1,000 RPMs. The competing technology spends in about 12,000 RPMs. I've used both, uh, invented both, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately. Uh, and the one that goes to 12,000 RPMs, if you spin it dry in your hand, it'll, it'll, burn your, yeah. it'll burn your fingers. So you have to spin it in a wet environment, blood being that. Uh, we've never been able to confirm that the heat generated by these devices is enough to do much to the artery, but I worry about it. Yeah. If, that's, if that was your... Yeah, that was the question. I think it's a concern. I do. I mean, I think the slower you go, you only want to go as fast as you need to go to get good images and to resect the plaque. You guys are too shy. This is not... You guys, come on. Or file some complaint or something. <laughs> Uh, you didn't mention very much about the endothelial cells. Do they grow over the, after you've cleaned out the artery, then does the layer of endothelial cells grow over mm -hmm. to be the inner lining of the vessel wall? Yeah, so the endothelial cells are the, the intima, that the main central lining of the artery. Uh, they're all resected. Uh, and it, it takes, depending on what you've done, if you haven't done anything else to the artery except clean it out, then it takes about a month for re-endothelialization in experimental models. I'm not sure exactly how, lo how long it takes in, in humans. Uh, but that means that you do not put a drug on it or put a stent on it. So if, if you put a drug and a, a stent with a drug on it, then it may not endothelialize for a year. And, and the whole time that it's not endothelialized, then it's more likely to have platelets stick to it and more likely to clot off. That's why patients who get a drug lean stand end up taking blood thinners for at least, well, six months to a year, depending on the doctor, what they recommend. But it's a good point that you want to, uh, and you want those surfaces to be as smooth as possible, because then there's less turbulence and there's less promotion of platelet deposition. Do you put them on anti-inflammatories while that they're healing? They're all on anti-platelet agents, yes, for, uh, 
we would do it for in the coronaries and historically, not in that particular patient, but in the coronaries we would do it for three months uh, without a stent. Uh, if you have a stent in there, then it's six months to a year. Any plated agent, so. But now it's aspirin and, and uh, Plavix, both. Dual, dual antiplatelet therapy is called. Uh, and then the, that has certain bleeding complications associated with it too, which you have to be cautious about that. Okay. Thank you so much for coming today and for your talk. It was a pleasure to hear about both of the personal as well as the medical and engineering sides. I have a comment and I guess a question. I would share with our audience that the inventors of OCT were um, honored with the 2017 Russ Prize. And I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that, Dr. Simpson. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, I, I just, I, I find it very ser serendipitous and wonderful that we had Rust Prize recipients who were responsible for the imaging technology that allows you to see what you're doing for these patients. So Fujimoto is the founder of, uh, of OCT. Uh, and he understands exactly how it works. He could explain it, I think he did. Maybe he gave a talk or he explained how it works. I should have attended that talk. Uh, <laughs> maybe I would know better. Uh, but uh, his contribution was really, I think, it is really, really remarkable. The dilemma has been that because OCT doesn't th see the blood, uh, that how do you how you correct for that? Let's say when you want to image and and block off the blood and, and it, temporarily, you know, it's not going to be blocked off for too long. I don't know if you, you have any idea how long you can close off a coronary artery and just work on the artery? Anybody want to guess? Here? Mm, let's say 30 minutes. Seems pretty long, doesn't it? 20? 10? That's too long, too. Only two minutes. So you have two minutes if you're going to work on a coronary artery, if you're going to close it off and work on it. That's, for example, you're going to put a balloon angioplast in it. You're going to blow the balloon up, and kind of maximum you leave the balloon up for a couple of minutes, uh, and then deflate it because the patient, most patients will have chest pain, uh, uh, sort of within two minutes. But Fujimoto, what he has shown us now is that we can see these arteries in such a unique way that maybe we'll have better predictors of what happens over the long term. And I, that's our goal, uh, because we can close the blood off for a couple of minutes. We can see about all we need to see. Uh, particularly if you want to clean it out, because cleaning that artery out that I showed, uh, it took about 20 seconds to do that. So our goal is to actually clean out the, the coronary arteries in less than a minute. Uh, and we think we can do that with the OCT imaging. Uh, and I'm not, not sure it came across as well as I would like, but it, it's the only way to know when to stop. There is no, there's nothing that fluoroscopy would tell you uh, really reliably about when, when to stop. It'll tell you kind of where to start, uh, but until you know when to stop, you can't really do much about the safety profile. And the FDA is totally concerned about the safety profile first. Efficacy is important too, but the safety profile has to be the key. When you're taking out the, or when you're trimming down the plaque, is it better to leave in a little tiny bit of plaque there and not go too far and damage the endothelium, or is it, do you try to go all the way and risk damaging the endothelium a little bit? How, where exactly do you stop? Yeah, so the endothelium is damaged. What you do not want to do is damage the medium, because uh, you clean out the endothelium. But this is, this is a great that you would ask the question, because it's widely debated. I say, get right down to the media and just leave a little bit of plaque exactly as you have. I want to do it your way. Most of the interventionists don't. They just uh, go right into the media. For example, Dr. Swint went into the media a little bit in that patient that I showed you. I would have stopped a little bit sooner. Uh, but it's a good observation to make because it is a source of debate. Uh, and Andreas Grunzig, the guy that founded the whole concept of balloon angioplasty, said that one of the great things about 
after an angioplasty is done, then it, when it comes back, it'll, it will come back about 40% of the time, the recurrence rate with angioplasty, or vessels narrow down again after angioplasty, 40% of the time. You'd redilate them, and then they came back a little bit less. And he said a little bit of scar on the surface of the vessel that you're treating is good because the platelets are less likely to stick to it, and it's smoother, and scar is smooth. And, and so the point being, if you could leave just a little bit a plaque there as long as it's really smooth and the media is not exposed. We know the media is pretty thrombogenic, just raw media exposed to blood flow, you, you're going to get platelets to stick on it. So maybe a quick follow up, just uh, if you did leave just a little bit of the plaque on the inside, um, would that be very different than just a normal ruptured plaque? Would that still be thrombogenic at all? So I don't know, uh, another good question, I don't know that um, I think the plaque itself is less thrombogenic than exposed raw media. I think that would be more likely to be. And you know, the raw media will endothelialize within, you know, uh, with nothing else on it in uh, about a month. So you can use any plated agents would be required for that. So. Thank you for spending the time today. Thank you.